Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Greetings and uh, good morning. Welcome to this briefing, press briefing on COVID-19 in the region of the Americas on March 31st, 2021. We apologize for your patience and thank you for continue being connected to us. This is Sebastian Oliel from the Communication Department of Bajo, and the session will last around an hour, and we will be taking questions from you up to that point. We have received questions by email, and you will be able to ask your questions live and also using the Q&A button. Always remember to include your name and your medium when you send your questions to us. Also, we have simultaneous interpretation to English, Portuguese, French, and Spanish, and you can use interpretation facilities through the uh, interpretation button. Dr. Carissa Etienne, director of PAHO, will give us some words uh, regarding the first three months of this year, 2021, uh, about the pandemic and the technical cooperation from PAHO uh, during this very quarter. Dr. Jarvas Barbosa, Assistant Director uh, of PAHO, the Director of Emergencies, uh, Dr. Ciro Garta, and Dr. Silvana Righieri, Director of our Management Manager of Incidents for Emergencies, uh, are with us. Dr. Etienne. Briefing. Our apologies for starting late. This is the last day of the quarter, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to take stock of the pandemic in our region since the start of 2021. Since January 1st, 2021, there have been over 19.7 million cases reported in the Americas. And we have lost more than 475,000 persons to COVID-19. This is equivalent to 1,747 plane loads. For the past four weeks, we have been reporting around 1 million new cases on average every seven days. This indicates that transmission is still very active in far too many places in our region. The number of deaths also remain high, with more than 34,000 deaths registered just last week, March 22nd to 29th. Brazil, Peru, Chile, and Paraguay have been reporting the highest rates. The recent influx in cases is overwhelming hospitals in several countries. For example, ICU occupancy rates are over 80% in all but two Brazilian states. And Jamaican hospitals are operating well above capacity. Mortality increases when this happens because patients have difficulty finding the care that they need and health workers are overburdened by tending to too many people at once. Today, the pandemic is as active as ever, and we have no option but to fight it. In fact, a few countries in our region, including Paraguay, Uruguay, and Cuba, are experiencing outbreaks in 2021 of greater magnitude than the ones that they faced in 2020. All countries of the region should be on high alert. In this pandemic, complacency leads to more cases. We urge our member states to reinforce surveillance and act at the first sign that cases are rising. D don't wait until you are overwhelmed. The risks for your people and health systems are just too high. The past three months have marked a critical phase of the COVID pandemic for our region. And there have been three areas where PARO, PAHO, 
has been especially focused. First, our surveillance network has been significantly expanded to identify and track variants of the SARS CoV 2 virus. 21 countries are now participating in our COVID 19 genomic surveillance network, giving us a much better picture of the variants circulating in our region. At least one of the three variants of concern have been identified in 32 countries and territories of the Americas. And we are working hand in hand with member states to increase their capacity and to improve reporting of these variants. We are also conducting analysis to better understand the real impact of these variants in some of the most highly affected areas. A technical consultation on variants this week concluded that the message remains the same. It is important to continue and strengthen genomic surveillance, but what we must do to prevent transmissions with or without circulation of virus is to maintain the public health distancing and control measures that already exist, including now vaccination. And these measures have not been modified in any way. In terms of vaccines, immunization is another high priority topic for us in the Pan American Health Organization. On January 1st, only a handful of countries were vaccinating against COVID-19 in our region. But this picture has changed. As of yesterday, 124 million people have received at least one dose of vaccines in the Americas, and more than 58 million have completed their vaccination schedule. Almost all our member states are rolling out vaccines. Haiti will soon follow suit as the first shipment from COVAX arrives in the coming weeks. COVAX shipments have reached many participating countries, enabling us to protect at least some of the populations that are at greater risk. In an effort coordinated by the Pago Revolving Fund, more than 2.5 million doses from COVAX have arrived in 17 countries in our region in the last 30 days. This week, Guyana, Bahamas, Belize, and Trinidad and Tobago are getting their first shipments. But as we celebrate progress, we cannot close our eyes to the fact that vaccine supply continues to be our greatest challenge. A large part of this is due to delays in production as manufacturers rush to scale up capacity. But we are also seeing for too many examples of vaccine nationalism, which limits global availability even further. The current system is hardwired for inequity, and, and that is not acceptable. Vaccines should be available to all who need them, regardless of where they live. PAHO remains a champion for equitable vaccine access, and we will continue to fight for more supplies until our region is fully immunized. Vaccines, though, are not the only scarce resource in 2021. As cases have risen, some member states have faced shortage of supplies that are essential to protect personnel and to treat cases. In the first few months of this year, the availability of oxygen and anesthetic medicine has been threatened by the speed of new cases that are flooding hospitals in Brazil, Peru, and other places. This underscores the dire consequences of a pandemic that can quickly overburden our health systems. That even a well-established supply chain is struggling to cope. Our third area of focus has been to accelerate the procurement of drugs and PPEs 
that are needed on the front line. This year alone, PAHO has helped procure more than 3 million units of medical masks for the region. And we are actively supporting governments every day to find solutions for oxygen and other supply limitations. As cases rise, we will continue to support countries to secure the PPEs, the drugs, and the other supplies that they need. As vaccines arrive, we will do our part to ensure that they are delivered as quickly and equitably as possible within countries. But we don't have enough vaccines right now to stop active outbreaks. This requires much broader coverage than is possible at this time. So until then, we must never, never forget that prevention is always the best option. And we do know exactly how to prevent this virus. PAHO keeps track of and analyzes mobility data from internet and phone companies. And we see time and again that as the population in certain areas live home more frequently, that cases rise. When holidays come and people from different households meet indoors, cases rise, as they do when people travel more. So summer is ending in the Southern Hemisphere, and it is no accident that the vacation season is being followed by a rise in cases in several countries. Without preventive action, our region could face an upsurge that is even larger than the last one. So let me be as clear as possible. My main guidance for places experiencing surges in transmission can be summarized in two words, stay home. If you can avoid having others over, avoid it. And if you must leave your house, wear a mask, wash your hands frequently, and stay away from crowded spaces. You, you know, this is a shared responsibility. In a region as unequal as ours, where many rely on informal income, governments must support their people to allow them to stay home. We all have a role to play in following the public health measures that have been put in place to protect our communities. This is how we save lives, and this is how we beat COVID-19. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Dr. Etienne. Eh, vamos a pasar Thank you very much, Dr. Etienne. Now we are going to go to questions and answers. We have several here, and we are continuing to receive questions in the Q&A and the chat. The first question is from uh, CNN Radio in Argentina. The question is, could the COVAX mechanism broaden uh, to supply instead of a maximum of 20% of the population, 80% of whatever or whatever is necessary so that all countries may be able to immunize their population? And this is from Desiree Jaminovich. Um, uh, she says also that there, uh, she was looking at numbers in her country and region, and there is a big gap between the contracts signed and the vaccines reaching the countries and she wants to know why is this happening, what factors may have generated these gaps between purchases and deliveries. How could this be improved, Dr. Barbosa? Thank you very much for your question, uh, Ms. Demovich, uh, regarding how to increase the 20%, which is the first goal for COVAX, that 20% is related to the most vulnerable groups of the population. It is estimated that in each country, this 20% would be enough to include uh, um, the elderly uh, um, adults with a chronic disease, which will be a risk for developing a more serious form of COVID-19. But without a doubt, we need to go beyond. The objective is to have enough vaccines to vaccinate all persons who need to be vaccinated in order to uh, reach, together with public health measures, the 
um, control of transmission. Bajo is seeking to broaden access through COVAX, but also through negotiations with countries that purchased more vaccines than they needed for the population to seek that those countries will donate a vaccine for the COVAX mechanism, especially for the Latin America and Caribbean regions, and also through the revolving fund, looking for alternatives so that it is possible to uh, offer supplies of vaccines beyond the 20% of what the COVAX facility has um, committed to provide. Regarding that gap between the regions, I think the director has already underlined the issue of the need to have equitable access to the vaccines. If in the world we don't have a mechanism, a, an arrangement, an agreement among countries for access to happen equitably, what will prevail is the market rules. The richer regions, the richer countries are going to buy the vaccines and COVAX and other facilities that have in mind equitable access will have difficulty delivering those vaccines. Toward the end of April, we are hoping to have a decrease or, or up until April, we will have a decrease in the number of vaccines. The, the situation is different. There is a, a political problem in China in India, where the government is limiting the numbers of vaccines that are exported from India, and there are other uh, situations. AstraZeneca has two new sites, one in Italy, one in Spain, that are going to begin to deliver vaccines uh, for the COVAX mechanism, including for Latin America and the Caribbean, and we hope this will solve some of those manufacturing issues, and uh, there will be a greater availability of vaccines for our region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Next questions. Oh, one related to the variants in English now from Luke Stephen Taylor from the British Medical Journal and from Ternis McCoy from the Mash Washington Post. The question reading is the situation in Brazil for the rest of the region. Is there a worry that it is a picture of what is to come elsewhere thanks to a P1 variant? Um, also, what is the latest and the latest understanding of P1. Is it of concern? Uh, y Terence McCoy del Washington Post uh, pregunta también en inglés, uh, does it appear that the P1 is playing a large role uh, in driving the surge in cases in Latin America? Is there fear uh, that the entire region, given shortcomings in medical sub uh, capacity, uh, could soon look as overwhelmed by the virus as Brazil? Dr. Alighieri. Yes, thank you, Sebastian, for these two questions from the British Medical Journal and uh, from the Washington Post. Um, the, the, the actual situation in Brazil is the result of an increased transmission following both the Christmas and Carnival high movements of populations. I'd like to, to stress that during these two periods, the implementation of public health measures uh, was suboptimal in most of the territory of Brazil, therefore triggering the amplification of the transmission and the wide geographic dispersion. We can say that the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is high or very high in all regions of Brazil at the same time, north, center, northeast, southeast, and south. This is one of the main differences compared to the first wave in Brazil during 2020. As an example, during most of the last week, the daily number of deaths reported countrywide in Brazil was superior to the USA, which was the driver of the epidemic in the Americas during the second semester of 2020. The situation in Brazil reflects how the partial implementation of public health measures or the untimely relaxation of these public health measures can negatively impact 
on the dynamics of the transmission. In addition of the suboptimal implementation of these public health measures, I'd like to um, note that the circulation of the PON variant of concern countrywide in Brazil is clearly contributing to the increase of cases. We observe that the P1 variant seems to be more transmissible compared to the wild type that was circulating during 2020. We are also receiving signals, reports in different states of Brazil that young adults are hospitalized in ICUs in higher numbers compared to 2021. Regarding the, the spread of the P1 variant, so in addition of Brazil, we have received reports of the P1 detection in eight countries and territories of South America. Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Peru, Colombia, Paraguay, Venezuela, and French Guiana. P1 was also detected in the three countries of North America, the USA, Canada, and Mexico, and in both French and Dutch Caribbean, and in Panama. What is the contribution of the parent variant to the dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 in these countries is under investigation. I'd like to stress again and again, and following the um, remarks of Dr. Etienne, that the same public health measures that we used last year still work against the variants circulating in our region, including the P1 variant initially detected in Brazil and the B117 originally detected in the UK. In conclusion, I would say that countries that do not monitor closely their epidemiological laboratory and hospital indicators, and that do not timely adjust their public health measures, would be at risk to face soon the highest burden of their health systems and would be at high risk to have their ICUs overwhelmed. I hope I have answered both uh, concerns of both journalists. Uh, thank you. Gracias, eh, Dr. Aldigieri. Eh, una... Thank you, Dr. Aldigieri. A second question from Terence McCoy from the Washington Post, also in English, says, uh, the emergence of P1 in the region will demand faster vaccination, but will countries be able to meet that burden? Why has Latin America, besides Chile, been so much slower than other regions to vaccinate? Dr. Barbosa? Thank you for this question. I think that we have two, two topics that we need to, to review. First, as the director mentioned, we, we are trying to, we, we are developing many efforts to get more vaccines available to Latin America and the Caribbean. This is crucial. Uh, Latin America has been hardly hit by the pandemic. Now we have new variants, so we need indeed more vaccines. But it's important also to see that even Chile, that it has uh, the highest uh, immunization coverage so far in Latin America are facing, Chile is facing an increase of the number of cases. Why? Because the vaccine is not an uh, immediate response to the increase. The vaccine will take some time to have some uh, effects uh, to reduce the transmission. So the, the immediate response now is to apply the public health measures that we know that can reduce the transmission. The Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation made the, uh, an estimation last week that in the Americas, if 95% of the population wear masks until the first day of July, we can save 44,000 lives in the region. So it's very important while we are trying to get more vaccines that we can keep all the public health measures that can reduce the transmission wear masks to avoid closed and crowded spaces. The national authorities need to follow up the epidemiological situation in each state, uh, province or city and adopt the proper measures that can reduce immediately 
the transmission. This is the best way to combine these two pillars, to get more vaccines and to uh, see all the options that we are working with the countries, to get more vaccines. But at the same time, do not think that the vaccines will stop the transmission next week. They need to keep all the public health measures. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. <coughs> Siguiente pregunta, perdón, viene de... Thank you, doctor. Next question is from Dalian Colin uh, from TN23 Guatemala, and it reads this. What actions should Guatemala adopt, as well as Honduras and Mexico, with the groups of migrants who continue to reach the southern border, given the increase in transmission of COVID-19, which is being reported by authorities, uh, health authorities from those governments. Dr. Cido, thank you very much for your question. It is a question that, um, that applies to uh, countries in the region where there are movements of people. The first point that the countries should analyze and review are the epidemiological conditions of the uh, place of origin and the place of destination of the p people who are mobilizing. We need to know whether the, if the migrants are implementing personal protection measures during their mobilization through the countries or in the places where they settle temporarily or their destination places where where they are waiting to cross a border or displacing or or going to other places in these situations it's important for the countries that are receiving these migrants consider consider ac access to health care for migrants because if we if access to health care is hard, then the migrants could develop symptoms during their movement, and this could be related to COVID, and there could be an increase in number of cases, and ultimately this could, could translate into um, contagion during transit or in the places where they are temporarily or more permanently housed. Also, we need to implement access to health services and also access to diagnostic tests as well and to make sure that the um, places where they are um, staying for a longer period of time, that in these places they could implement public health measures, physical distancing, and other um, measures. It also, surveillance for early detections of cases is very important, and in some cases, antigen tests have been implemented, uh, which are now more accessible, mainly those in those places where COVID is being transmitted uh, in larger um, concentrations. Migrants are leaving very challenging circumstances and they're seeking for better opportunities. But at the same time, we should make an appeal to those who are thinking of leaving their countries of origin that this is not the time to do it because the transmission conditions for COVID-19 as has been expressed here by Dr. Barbosa, the director and Dr. Aldeguerri, in many of the countries is increasing significantly, and in particular when protection measures are not being implemented. And so it is prudent to stay home and not subject others, family members or others, to the risk of pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ugarte. The next question comes from Cassandra Garrison from Reuters, Mexico and Central America in English. The question reads, Campaigns for children in Mexico like rubella and measles been disrupted due to the coronavirus pandemic. Does PAHO have data on how many children are lacking their scheduled vaccines? Uh, why do these campaigns remain delayed at this time? Is there a lack of supplies or medical personnel? And what would allow the campaigns to move forward? Uh, también pregunta, are there similar delays on children vaccine campaigns elsewhere in the region? Dr. Barbosa. 
Thank you, Cassandra, for the very important question because the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, affected many priorities uh, in public health, including immunization. Uh, Mexico had a, 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 an outbreak of measles last year, 196 cases in Mexico City and the state of Mexico. The outbreak was successfully uh, controlled by the rapid response provided by the country. So they have no transmission now of measles. Last year, there was a, a campaign against measles that was scheduled, but the WHO and PAHO recommended that during the peak of transmission, you, you should postpone the campaigns in order to avoid that the, the, the people going to the health center, in the lines, it could be a, a, an opportunity to increase the transmission. And Mexico has the campaign that was postponed. It will be performed this year from April to June. The goal is to vaccinate 13 million uh, of children between one to nine years. Uh, and the, the, this is very important. In many countries in the, in the region, there was a, a very important impact, mainly on the first semester of 2020. We, uh, we are getting data from other countries to, to monitor the immunization coverage. There was a reduction around 23% in the second semester, in the first semester, but fortunately in the second semester, uh, the data is showing that the countries were able to restart the vaccination and increase it in 12%. So we are supporting the countries the, the procurements from the countries for the year 2021 are very similar to 2020 and 2020, uh, 2019 through the PAHO revolving fund. So uh, the countries will have all the vaccines that they need to vaccinate against measles, rubella, polio, and many other diseases. But it's very important to keep these, uh, these programs running well with protective, personal protective equipment to the to the healthy workers in order to, to allow, allow them to, to, to run their services and to provide the vaccination in safe conditions. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. La siguiente pregunta. Thank you, doctor. The next question is by Inés Capdevila from La Nación, Argentina, and her question is, the first curve of the pandemic in Latin America was long, and high. Are we also expecting for the second curve to be that way if uh, vaccination is not accelerated? And what other measures will be implemented to shorten that curve? So when COVID cases started to appear in 2020 in our region, most governments quickly established containment measures. These measures work to prevent what was could be a rapid increase of cases then. In most places, the epidemiological curve was actually flattened at first. Despite a visible surge in cases in the Americas, most cities coped well and were able to protect their health systems from collapse. We, now we are seeing rising cases across our region, even in places that had seem to contain or avoid previous outbreaks. And there is a real risk that this current surge in cases will be larger than last year's surge for several countries. In places like Uruguay, Brazil, and Cuba, it already is. But let me stress, we are not helpless. As many of us on this conference have said over and over again, the same measures that we used last year can still work against the variants that are circulating in our region this year. We all know the solutions. We measures such as social distancing, the restriction of large gatherings, the proper use of masks, and all of those have the capacity to slow down transmission now as they did in 2020. Today, we need, though, the same level of commitment that our region showed in 2020. Now is not the time to relax. 
This will buy us time to roll out vaccines in our region and protect us from future outbreaks. And Dr. Barbosa spoke about this very eloquently. Until we get 70% or more of our populations vaccinated, we must continue smart, effective, and targeted public health measures. So to make these measures easy, I want you to remember three Cs. Avoid closed places with poor ventilation. Avoid crowded places with many people nearby. Avoid close contact settings, such as close range uh, conversations. And of course, hand washing, frequent hand washing, and wearing of masks. And I really want to urge governments to be cautious about lifting restrictions because we could see new increases in cases and hospitalizations. So for now, the guidance that I shared in my remarks earlier today remains the same. If you can, please stay home. Gracias, eh, Dr. Etienne. Eh, siguiente Thank pregunta. you, Dr. Etienne. The next question is by Adolfo Picas from La República in Peru. He's saying that last week, the EMAS, the European uh, Agency, advised against the use of ivermectin for the treatment. So can we categorically say that this uh, medicine cannot be used against SARS-CoV-2, or are we awaiting further research in some countries are selling this as an anti-COVID combo? And he's asking what to do in case of these practices. Dr. Aldeguiri, thank you very much for this question. First of all, I would like to highlight that PAHO's position as to the use of ivermectin has not changed as of May 2020 when we published our first note. We recommended not to use this product in patients with COVID-19 except when participating in a clinical trial. The same applies to chloroquine. And so what we sent to the ministries and the, is to review the standards for clinical treatment when those protocols include those medicines that are approved for other use in humans. Chloroquine is a medicine for malaria, ivermectin for parasites, and then we have the third one that is an antibiotic. So for more than a year, WHO for the clinical management of COVID-19 and potential new therapeutics. WHO reviews, sums up the research and the evidence and publishes on their website a summary of the evidence that is shared with the countries, the scientific societies, and the ministries also generate specific recommendations and also develop training and sharing of the information as well as updated clinical guidelines. I think that with this, I have addressed the question by our colleague from Peru on ivermectin. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Now I would like to give the floor to Luis Alejandro Amaya, who is an editor with Mesa America with EFE in Bogota, Colombia. Luis, I give you the floor. Please go ahead. Good morning to all of you. Several countries in Latin America on April 11th, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, are thinking to delay the elections for the National Assembly on June 6th. Mexico is going to be hosting the largest election processes in their history. What is the recommendation by PAHO to those countries that are having elections? You know that there are large um, crowds getting together to vote. So 
how can we avoid this becoming a source of uh, transmission for SARS-CoV-2? Thank you, Luis. Dr. Rugarte, would you please address this question? Luis, that is a very important question because indeed several countries are having various electoral processes. Last year, elections were held in several countries and experience has shown us that the most significant risk of transmission is during the campaigns where we see the travel traveling of the, we see the candidates traveling the country, we see large crowds and that all that has increased transmission during the electoral campaign. Some, in some countries that situation has led to higher transmission and also to the analysis as to whether the electoral process should continue. The electoral bodies, by following recommendations by health agencies and others, and in some cases, such as in the case of Bolivia, they decided to delay elections. And uh, in some cases, such as uh, Chile, they are analyzing also this possibility given the epidemiological situation in the country close to elections. The voting process has been the subject of new protocols for social distancing, the increase in the number of uh, voting stations as well as an expansion of the times to vote and some cleaning measures that have also had very good results on election day. The recommendation to the countries has been to have a remote virtual campaign resorting to other media to avoid transmission and if possible for the voting itself to be by mail or here we are not at that level in some of these countries, but this should be a measure to be taken into account. During the voting itself, those individual, individuals that have symptoms or individuals that are under quarantine should not vote on election day, should not go to vote on election day, and this clearly has an impact on the individual right to vote and also the right the population has to protect their own health. In this regard, it is, impossible, it is important to take into account whether the country would be implementing measures in connection with those individuals that cannot vote. And finally, we recommend for the electoral process to be seen as a whole, the electoral campaign the voting process and the implementation of the measures, a measure that is highly important and that should come from the electoral bodies and the health community is an active communication campaign throughout the media for the population on the measures to be implemented during the electoral process and also during elections day. There are some specific protocols, some specific measures that individuals should be familiar with before voting and also to better understand the reasons why the situation is analyzed and elections may eventually be delayed. And this will increase our certainty as a health agency, we do give priority to the health, the well-being of the population to reduce transmission, and we are hopeful to control the pandemic as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. We have several questions in the chat related to Paraguay, questions by Ariel Sara Acosta from Channel 19, also Carlos Morales from Ultima Hora, Soto from Radio Monumental, and Mirta Gonzalez. I am going to sum up these questions. What is 
Pajo's position in terms of the of the vaccine that did not arrive to the country? Why is it that Paraguay has not received the number of vaccines that were prepaid? And also, what is the schedule for vaccine delivery? Dr. Barbosa, could you please address this question? Thank you. Thank you for these questions. We do understand the concern in Paraguay and also in all of the countries that are interested in having access to the vaccines as soon as possible. But let me clarify what our role is in terms of the delivery of vaccines through COVAX. The decision process for the list of countries that will be receiving the vaccines is drafted in Geneva by an independent committee that was established by Gavi and WHO. That committee uses an algorithm to be able to establish a balance of the six regions of the world among countries that are countries supported by the mechanism, by the facility, and high income self financing uh, countries. So, when COVAX applies the same. It, Criteria when the committee sends the list of countries, we start establishing contact with the country to make sure that everything is ready to receive the vaccine, the regulations, the import license, among other items, as well as the contact with the producer so that the producer may start packing the vaccines to make it possible to be sent to the country. Paraguay was the fourth country in South America that received the first delivery of vaccines, but Paraguay and the other seven countries, the first eight countries that received that deployment that represented 35% of the vaccines that were estimated for February and March, made it I mean, they received the first deployment, but then there was another 75% that was not possible to be delivered because publicly it was indicated that the producer AstraZeneca Bioscience from South Korea reduced the vaccines to be given to COVAX due to technical issues from 25 to 12 million doses. So we had to implement this reduction we think that it is very important. COVAX has started to deliver vaccines. We have more than 2.5 million doses that have been delivered in various countries of the region. We are going to reach all of the countries in the upcoming week, and we are also in contact with producers so that we can indicate when the other two-thirds of the vaccines will be delivered as estimated for February and March. As for April and May, Paraguay has other vaccines that have been also estimated to be delivered. By late May, the country will receive, as well as all the other countries, all of the vaccines that was ex that were expected to be delivered to the country. Unfortunately, clearly, we are indeed working with the producers, supporting the countries so that we can bring the vaccine. But unfortunately, this is not only enough for COVAX and the revolving fund, but also for countries that have acquired the vaccine through bilateral negotiations. And we are facing issues with limited production. Producers seem to be promising more vaccines than the ones that they actually had to deliver before there may be technical issues, but we are also working with producers to have all of the information and be able to report to the countries when the vaccines will arrive. This is what we do when we get in contact with the country, when everything is ready, when we have the flight number and the time that they will arrive to the country. We are working with the governments, with the 
with the government in the country to try to find other vaccines, other emergency solutions to be implemented in the short term. So PAHO continues to provide cooperation to the country, continues to support the country, and there are certain events that are beyond our control. We do not produce vaccines, therefore, we are on behalf of Paraguay and all of the countries in the in Latin America and the Caribbean. We're looking for the best solution to have the vaccine arrive as soon as possible to the country, and we will continue to cooperate with the government to rapidly offer the vaccines that the country needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. Now, because of time, we are reaching the end of our press briefing today, and the last question is by Wesley Divi from Caribbean Medium Corporation. It is in English. As WHO PAHO see for itself in brokering negotiations for transfer of surplus supplies of vaccines from countries such as the USA, Canada, Europe, and the UK to the Caribbean subregion. Dr. Etienne. Thank you all for this question. Um, so, in our region and elsewhere, what we are seeing is that leaders are facing enormous pressures to purchase additional vaccines from manufacturers um, on a bilateral agreement basis that is resulting in competition for manufacturing and delivery, and at times, higher prices. So, PAHO is tracking this closely, and we are keeping a close eye on the gaps in vaccine access. We are well aware that some of the poorest countries in our region only have guaranteed access to 20% of their population through COVAX. So we are looking at multiple avenues to address this gap. This, of course, builds on our region's commitment to solidarity and on Pago's track record in vaccine equity for the Americas. We have turned our focus to the remaining gaps in countries which may be as much as 80% in the poorest ones. And the Revolving Fund for Vaccine has been a core pillar of our work in immunization that supports member states for more than 40 years to access safe, efficacious, and high-quality vaccines at affordable prices. And, and so with COVID, it's no different. The Revolving Fund is, we are looking around, scouring for any available supplies worldwide to help countries from the region access additional doses. In addition, PAHO and ECLAC, we are working together to explore ways to expand vaccine access within the inter-American system. This includes encouraging countries from our region and beyond to share doses that they will not use. This could occur through vaccine donations or loans to PAHO or through the COVAX facility itself. As always, PAHO will play an active role in coordinating across countries to expand vaccine coverage in our region until we have reached equitable access to vaccines for all. We give our commitment to work with all of our member states within the inter-American system at the global level to advocate for and put in place mechanisms so our countries can have access to vaccines um, so that we can bring this pandemic to an end. Thank you for your questions and thank you for being with us today. Muchas gracias, Dr. Etienne, y gracias thank a you very much, Dr. Etienne. Thank you very much for being with us today. Please remember that you can find further information on our website and also continue in contact with us via email. Thank you all again, and we will be in contact. Thank you. Greetings to all. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.